for the next three weeks, and we're going to talk about a, a subject that isn't talked about very much, but it's a subject that's in the Scriptures and needs to be talked about, and so we're taking a bit of an excursus, if you will, uh, so we're going we're gonna to spend time talking about church discipline. And, uh, and you're thinking, uh-oh, who's in trouble? No, that's not the point of church discipline. Actually, the elders some time ago uh, decided that this is something that we really need to teach on and shore up in our own church. And so uh, they spent a considerable amount of time um, coming up with a document that they've written. And at the three weeks, at the end of the three weeks, I'll present that document to you just so you know the process that, that the elders are working through. I'm thankful for elders that take the Word of God very seriously, um, and even in difficult subject matters, uh, such as church discipline. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to ask that the Lord would bless our time, and uh, hopefully this will be an encouragement. That's my desire, that God would use this to encourage us as saints of God. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to come together today. What a blessing it is to celebrate the Lord's table, to sing these wonderful songs. I thank you for the team who led us so well. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd bless them and bless all that have participated in this service, Father, that hopefully brings you glory and honor. Now, Lord, as we walk into a difficult subject matter, I pray that you would give me grace, that you'd fill me with your spirit, that I would speak the things that are pleasing to you, and Lord, that for the rest of us here, that you would give us ears to hear so that we might be the church that you desire for us to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the title of the sermon this morning is How to Keep God's Church Holy, uh, part one. There will be three parts to this. And uh, as I mentioned, that uh, church discipline when we say these words, church discipline, when these words are uttered, they conjure up all manner of thoughts and concepts, right? Anger, well, the church is mad, or the judgmentalism, uh, lack of love, legalism. And no doubt that churches have handled the biblical concept of church discipline with anger and judgmentalism and a lack of love and in a legalistic manner. There's no question that churches have failed in this. And by the way, just an addendum, the church of Jesus Christ is not perfect. The church of Jesus Christ is full of fallible, sinful human beings. Our job as the church is to pursue holiness and righteousness as best we can in the power of the Lord. So there is no question that the church of Jesus Christ has failed uh, in this. But we simply, uh, we, we, and, and, and as a result of that, the typical response of the evangelical church then is to skip the subject altogether. Well, let's not talk about it since, since we failed at it at times. Let's, let's not talk about it. Well, we simply can't skip or avoid what the Lord has given us in His Word, right? We can't do that. And, and so church discipline, however, if properly understood, is a powerful tool that keeps God's church not only holy, but powerfully hopeful in a world that's slipping away in sinful decay. So the elders, as I mentioned, thought this topic was important enough to form a subcommittee on the elder team, study it out, and write a paper on it. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm, uh, as I mentioned, I'll share those conclusions with you in week number three. So, before you turn to me and say, Pastor Mark is going the way of loveless legalism, uh, before you say that, just give me the benefit of the doubt and spend the next three weeks with me understanding this very important, very biblical doc, uh, doctrine and topic. Um, by the way, a very helpful and biblical resource that I'm going to use for this series is written by Dr. Jonathan Lehman, and uh, it's very helpful, and I would commend it to you. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to tell you comes from this book, and so I would encourage you. It's called Church Discipline, How the Church Protects the Name of Jesus. That's a beautiful subtitle, How the Church Protects protects the name of Jesus. So the main idea really is a question this morning, what is church discipline? What is church discipline? It's such a scary phrase 
that is both misunderstood and often misapplied. Church discipline is a part of the discipleship process of the church. We desire to be a church of discipleship. We, in fact, have done a very good job over the past several years in the area of discipleship, thanks to Pastor Tim and, and uh, Elliot Richards. Uh, they've done a tremendous job really inculcating a spirit of discipleship in the church. And so church discipline is a faction of this idea of discipline. And to be disciplined in a, really, in a real sense is to be discipled. So how is a Christian disciplined? They are disciplined through instruction and correction. They are disciplined through instruction and correction. This, in part, is the goal of the Christian life as articulated by Paul to his son in the faith in Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, when discussing the power of the Word of God. Many of you know this verse. If not, it's a wonderful verse that you should underline in your Bible, uh, speaking to the Scriptures. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So do you see that list in the text there? Teaching. What is teaching? It's showing what is right. Reproof. What is reproof? Reproof is rebuke when one is not getting it right. What is correction? Correction is how to get right, and then training is how to, in fact, stay right. All right, so, so God gives us in His Word here a process that we are to walk through, and, and this is what the Word of God does. This is, this is what people, the, the people of God use to help the people of God live in a way that's pleasing to God. After all, that's our goal, isn't it, as followers of Christ, that we would be pleasing to God. So, church discipline is a tool then to perpetuate holiness within a congregation. More formally, church discipline is the process of removing a professing Christian from church membership and, and, and the participation in the communion table, just like we participated uh, just a few minutes ago. However, to be clear, it's not forbidding one under the discipline from attending the worship service or sitting under the preaching of the Word of God. What better place would one under discipline sit is under the preaching of the Word of God. As Jonathan Lehman says in his book, it's a refusal, church discipline is a refusal to give a person the Lord's Supper. It's excommunicating or excommunioning the person. He goes on to say in the life of the church that there are two forms of discipline that I've already alluded to. There is formative discipline and corrective discipline. Formative discipline helps to form the disciple through instruction. Corrective discipline helps to correct the disciple through correcting sin. So, we spend time all the time, whether it's from the pulpit, whether it's from an equipping class ministry, whether it's in our teens or, or whatever ministry, we're, we're always instructing. And so that's a proactive way of discipline. We want people to understand the truth of the Word of God. Corrective discipline is correcting that person when they are determined to live in a way that's contrary to the profession that they have made as a follower of Christ. Uh, so church discipline then is first and foremost, and I want you to hear me on this, church discipline is first and foremost loving. It's loving. Let me give you some reasons why. It shows love for the individual because it warns them about their sin and leads them to repentance. When someone is functioning in a way that is contrary to what God's Word has to say, we as the body of Christ have a responsibility to love them and speak into their lives. Secondly, it shows love for the church because it protects the weaker sheep from sin and the sinner. It's easy, so easy for the sinner then to start becoming divisive within the context of the local church. It shows love for the world that is watching the church and gives hope to them as they see the church being used in transformation. 
There's one organization, there's one organism on the face of this earth that actually is used by God to transform people into the image of Christ, and that is the church. The church does that. And so when we are, we are, the, when we are functioning as the church, we will function with church discipline. And it shows love for Christ because it exalts His holy name by our obedience to Him. First and foremost, we are concerned about the holiness of Christ. So love, then, should be the motivation behind church discipline, not punishment, not excommunication, not, aha, I gotcha. It's not the spirit of church discipline at all. I hope is to spend the next three weeks working through this important subject to bring clarity and understanding to it. So, why should then a church practice church discipline? Well, first, first it's commanded in the Bible. It's commanded in the Bible. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. I'll just be straight up honest with you. It's uncomfortable and it's difficult, but it is biblical. It's part of the gospel. It's an aspect of the gospel. And over the next three weeks, we'll flesh that out a little bit more. It causes the church to be healthy and holy. When you address sin in the church, sin is, is mitigated in the church, and the church becomes healthier and holier in the process. It distinguishes the church's witness before the world. It actually helps us to be a more uh, distinct witness. In other words, the church of Jesus Christ which I think the church of Jesus Christ today and has always had the problem of becoming more like the world than she ought to be. And so church discipline helps to keep the church on that holy path that she needs to be. The church is more than just a, a, a club, guys. The church is a, is a place where committed followers of Jesus Christ exude the holiness of Christ. So it distinguishes the church's witness before the world. It warns sinners of greater judgment that will come. I've mentioned this going through the book of Romans. Is judgment coming to the world? Absolutely it is. And that's just the reality that we face. So when people within the congregation are functioning in a pattern of sin... We, we have to have the spiritual wherewithal and love to address that, to release them, to help release them from that sin. Because what does sin do? Sin brings forth what? Death. So we want to help them get away from that, and we want to help the church to get away from that. So it warns the sinner of greater judgment that is inevitably coming. We don't know when but it will come. And it protects and exalts the reputation and the name of Jesus Christ. This is our main goal, isn't it? We want Jesus Christ to be exalted among us. Jesus Christ loves His church, and it is His goal to keep her holy. Now look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. This is an admonition to husbands, but couched in the admonition is... Uh, an understanding of Christ's love for His church and His desire for it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, so that He might present her, the church, to Himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be what? Holy and without blemish. So the church of Jesus Christ, while evangelism is critically important, and I, I want us to be an evangelistic church, and I want us to be a church that loves the world in the sense of helping to redeem the world, but we also... I would suggest to you, even more importantly, must be committed to being a holy church, a holy and set-apart congregation. Here in this passage, we see Jesus' love for His bride and His desire to keep her, which is us, 
holy. This is what the Lord's desire is for His body. If we refuse to be a church that obeys God in church discipline, we are saying that we love, we love better than God loves. We are saying we know better than what God knows. And so we need to submit ourselves to what God has to say and be willing to obey this. So let's be a church. Let's be a church that loves as God loves. Let's be a church that takes discipline seriously. Now, a caveat. When I've talked about church discipline in other venues, there's often the zealous people that pretty soon want church discipline for everybody and everything. And they're like a three-year-old with a hammer. Everything's a nail. We want to be careful. And hopefully as we walk through this series, you're going to see what that process looks like so that we're not just going around pointing at everybody. Oh, they need church discipline. Oh, they need... Just chill out for those of you that are zealous. And let's see what God has to say as we work through this process. But we need to be a church that takes discipline seriously. After all, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6 says this, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. What does that mean? Sometimes a real friend has to tell you what you need to hear. And it's actually an enemy that will tell you what you want to hear. I want to be a friend to you. And I want to tell you what you need to hear not what you want to hear. And if that means everyone leaves because they're irritated, my ultimate goal is to please Christ, not you. So let's spend time together thinking through this very important subject and then determine as a church to be excellent at loving each other with the truth. <clears throat> so this morning I want, to walk, I want to walk through three ideas regarding church discipline. First, it's important for us to understand what Jesus had to say about church discipline. Secondly, I want to talk about what the apostles have to say about church discipline. And then thirdly, I want to discover the purpose of church discipline. So that's, that's what we're going to do. Are you ready? Let's, let's start with Jesus on church discipline. So Jesus teaches what we would say, what I would say, is the most common understanding of what we call church discipline in the New Testament. Now keep in mind that the church at this point in time when Jesus is speaking hasn't officially started yet. So Jesus is giving teaching for the future church that will become reality soon after his death and resurrection. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 19. It's a very practical, a very practical process. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, I want you to tuck away in your mind, what, is, what does that mean? What is a Gentile and what is a tax collector, right? I would submit to you that we start to treat them like the unbeliever. How do we treat an unbeliever? We love them. We share God's truth with them. We speak to them in a way that's pleasing to the Lord and encouraging to them, right? So we don't just shun them. That's not the goal. The goal is to lead them back to repentance. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, verse 18 says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will, shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two, or, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Okay, so what's Jesus' perspective on, on church discipline? And again, I cannot possibly just pour into and dig out everything in this passage. We're doing kind of a 30,000 foot view over what Jesus thinks, his disciples thinks, and the perspective or the purpose of it. So what is Jesus' perspective on church discipline? Well, I want to give you some principles from the text. First of all, Jesus wants the sinner to do what? He wants the sinner to repent. He wants the professing follower of Christ to repent. That's what he wants. And Jesus, interestingly, in this process, wants the number of people involved to be small, as small as necessary to bring about repentance. 
Okay, that's, that's what we see Jesus doing right away. Jesus wants the church to be different than the world, different than the Gentile and the tax collector. The lives of church members should be markedly different than the world. I think that's a gut check for all of us. Are we markedly different than the world? Jesus wants a process of gracious warnings given to the one walking in sin, and He wants those warnings given by the church. Uh, By the way, who's the church? Us. We're the church. And so He's talking to individuals corporately, the church. We need to be responsible for this, okay? So, and if that one does not respond to the gracious warnings, then the church should exclude the one determined in their sin from the fellowship, hear me on this, from the fellowship of membership, okay? The fellowship of membership. Remember, membership is different than simply attendance to a a, a corporate worship service. It's different. Membership is willful submission to Christ's local church, and church membership is very pleasing to the Lord. I will submit to you who is the majority of the New Testament written to. Local churches comprised of local church members. Church membership is very important to our Lord. The particular sin that Jesus discusses is an interpersonal sin. Do you see that in the text? It says, against you, right? So if someone has sinned against you, so it's personal. But I want you to not fixate on the interpersonal part of Jesus' illustration here. Instead, we must focus on the repentance of the individual in sin. They are repentant or they are deter- They are, uh, uh, are, the question is, are they repentant or are they determined in their sin? Well, that begs the question, what is repentance? Well, repentance is a change of mind to a mind that agrees with God that leads. So it's not, it doesn't stop there. Repentance doesn't stop at an agreement with God, but it leads to a change of how I walk out my life. That's, so have you repented if you agree with God? Not yet. You haven't repented until it shows up in your walk. So you can think repentance all the time, but until it shows up and you walk it out, you haven't fully repented. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, Therefore walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Right? God's very concerned with how His followers comport themselves or how they behave themselves in this life. Okay? So, what is repentance? It's a change of mind, a mind that agrees with God that leads to a change of direction, the way one lives one's life. So, there's a bigger issue that must not be missed in the passage from our Lord. I want you to notice this, and Jesus is setting this up. The church has authority. The church of Jesus Christ has authority. This authority was given to the church by Jesus in Matthew 16, just two chapters prior. Look at Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter chimes in and replies, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He, then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, I want to be clear with you. This passage is not about Peter becoming the first pope, and then, uh, then the bizarre inauguration of apostolic succession. 
I don't believe that's what's going on here. This is about Peter's confession that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah or King or Christ. And Christ will build His church not on Peter, but on the fact that He is Messiah, the fact that He is King, the fact that He is Christ. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And those subjects in this institution called the church will exercise His authority to bind and loose on earth. In other words, make decisions in the context of the local church. And God will then agree in heaven. Whatever's loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever's bound on earth will be bound in heaven. So the church gets to make those decisions. They have the authority of Christ. The point, the local church, the leadership and the constituents of the local church have a measure of authority. Don't miss that. Matthew 18, when we look at Matthew 18, it's a throwback to Deuteronomy chapter 19 where Moses lays out the process for how a judge, uh, for how they are to judge criminal cases. I'd like you to indulge me and let's go back to, this is really a lot, isn't it? I'm throwing a lot at you. Aren't you glad for God's Word? I love it. I just love it. So anyway, forgive me, but you're getting a fire hose today. So let's go, to, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 19 and start in verse 15. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime, for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two uh, witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. Sounding familiar, isn't it? If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties, uh, p- both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, who are in the office in those days the judges shall inquire diligently and if and if the one if the witness is a false witness and has accused a brother falsely then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother so you shall this is I want you to see this so you shall purge the evil from your midst you see that you shall purge the evil from your midst and the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. You shall not pity. It is to be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So do you see what's going on here? This is, how, this is a judicial, this is a judicial handling of how to corporately, not individually, but how to corporately handle problems, okay? Go back to Matthew 18, verse 19. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, then ask, and it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So, when the church is confronted with those in her membership that confess Christ, but their lives are contrary to the holiness required by Christ, the church must do something. She can't sit on her hands And the Lord graciously lays out a process that doesn't just drive people from her midst, but attempts to draw the one back to the one who died for them. The goal is not excommunication, folks. The goal is always restoration. It's always the goal. We are grieved if excommunication is the result. We are hopeful in the midst of excommunication, excommunioning, we are hopeful that one day they repent and come back. That's always our goal. It's not, ha, finally we got rid of them. No, God forbid that we would have that spirit. So the church is called to play a role in the lives of her members. So, what is, the church tr- what is the church trying to determine in the life of the one who is resolute in living in a way that's contrary to God's way? They're trying to find some things out. Just like the priests and the judges and all of those, they were trying to get the truth and get to the truth. So it is with the church and her leadership. We need to get to the truth. And one of the things, or some of the things we need to understand is do they have a valid gospel profession? See, church membership is determining 
is this person indeed a follower of Jesus Christ? So we want to try to understand this person that is, is, is functioning in a way that's contrary to God. Do they have a valid gospel profession of faith? What, what does the way that they are living suggest? Can we as a church continue to affirm that this person is indeed a follower of Christ or have they, in fact, shipwrecked their faith and walked away from Jesus? We have to come to that conclusion. We can't just simply say, well, they prayed a prayer back in 1972 and so they're a believer in Christ and so they're good. No, it's not, that's not how it works. Praise God for that prayer. Praise God for that submission. But has it shown up in their life? I'm not talking about episodes of, of failure. I'm talking about what is their consistent profession. Does it match up with their life? That's the point. Okay? And if it doesn't, we don't write them off. We pursue them. And we pursue them in a motivation of love. Remember this, folks, remember this. Church discipline is about confirming that Jesus' representatives, we're Jesus, we are Jesus' representatives. It's about confirming that Jesus' representatives are genuinely representing Jesus. I'm not talking about hiccups along the way. I'm talking about consistent profession of faith matching up with their life. So one profitable thing that happens as a result of, of this discussion of church discipline and what we're even talking about right now is, is a serious self-reflection, right? It ought to, this, this, this discussion about church discipline ought to cause a serious self-reflection. It certainly did for me as I'm reading through this book and I'm reading through these passages. I'm like, wow, Mark, are you walking with the Lord the way you're supposed to be walking with the Lord? For crying out loud, Mark, you're standing up in front of the church and you're telling these people how to live. Is it showing up in your life or is it just lip service? We ought to all be doing that. Church isn't about coming here on a Sunday morning, hearing a clever message from a nerdy pastor, and then leaving. It's not church. Church is helping one another grow in Christ's likeness and holding one another's feet lovingly to the fire. That's what it's about. Okay? After all, what does the psalmist say? We should all be asking ourselves this question. Are the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart pleasing to the Lord? That's Psalm 19, 14. Why don't you write that down, and, and you ought to ask yourself that question on a daily basis. Are the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart pleasing to the Lord? Remember, if you are a member of Allendale Baptist Church, that means you are claiming to be a born-again ambassador of Christ and the church here, Allendale Baptist Church, has confirmed this. We voted you in based on your testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. And so your responsibility is you must continue to pursue Christ-like holiness, right? But also, if you are not a member of Allendale Baptist Church, why not? Why not? It is God's will that you are a member of a local church for your protection and for your spiritual growth. God's plan does not include individual, rugged individualistic Christianity. We need each other. We need each other. His design is that Christians are members of a local body, not just the global Catholic small c. All that means is universal. Don't worry. Don't get nervous. Right? Small c, Catholic church. We're all part of that if we are in Christ. But then the next logical step is that what the Bible says in the book of Acts, they were saved, they were baptized, and what? They were added to the church. Right? Why? That's His design. We are to be members of the local body for our own spiritual growth and protection and the protection of His church. So what is spiritual discipline? Well, first of all, we can see what Jesus' perspective is on church discipline, but now let's take a look at the apostles' perspective. What, what the apostles on church discipline? 
uh, like I said, Jesus isn't the only one. And oftentimes we think that, that Matthew 18 is the only passage in the Scriptures that deal with church discipline. But his disciples, the apostles, have something to say as well. So let's start with the Apostle Paul. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression... By the way, who are we talking about here? We're not talking about people outside of the church. We're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. Get that distinction, okay? Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of what? Gentleness, not irritation, frustration, and annoyance, but gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Okay, so again, Jesus, to Jesus' earlier point, there should be initially as few people as possible involved in church discipline. This is an example of the one-on-one, -on -one, if your brother or sister is caught up in a transgression. All right? So those in the church who are walking with the Lord, according to this passage, have a responsibility to restore people who are not walking in Christ-likeness, and they must do it not in a spirit of pride and haughtiness, but in a spirit of gentleness. In a spirit of gentleness. Paul's admonition is twofold. Discipline also helps the restorer, if you can see that in the text, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Discipline also helps the restorer stay on track, right? Because if I'm going to come and hold Bob accountable about something, what does that automatically do for me? I better have my act together before I go and talk to him, right? I ought to be walking with the Lord and making sure that I am pleasing to God before I ever try to hold someone else's feet to the fire. So there's an immediate discipleship benefit for me in that process as well, okay? Now look at Paul's Letter to Ephesus, he talks about it again in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful work of darkness, but instead expose them. So here we see Paul saying, let's expose the sin, not in the world, for crying out loud. Uh, we don't have to do much work on that, do we? Uh, it's, that's right out there. But it's within the context of the church, Okay. And so we want to expose them. The Christian must expose sin. Again, not in a spirit of judgment, but in the spirit of protection for the person and for the church. How about Paul's letter to Titus? Titus chapter 3, verse 10. As, a person, uh, as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Wow! Have you ever saw that passage before? That's, that's a startling passage. And I will say this, it seems that the sin of divisiveness has a special distinction in Paul's mind. If the divisive person, and we're not just talking about someone who's just passively in sin, kind of in his own world. No, this person is actively dividing the church. Well, that's a problem in Paul's eyes, and it needs to be dealt with quickly and decisively. So if the decisive person will not hear after two warnings, do you see that? If they will not hear after two warnings, then three strikes and he's out. That's, that's what the text seems to be indicating here. Divisiveness is that serious because God desires humility and unity within his church body. We don't want to achieve unity just by ignoring and doing the, and doing the, uh, ostrich, in the head, ostrich head in the sand and just ignoring. No, we need to know each other and be able to lovingly call out stuff in one another's lives and help each other grow in holiness and therefore unity. How about Paul's letter to Thessalonica? Well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them that he may be ashamed. Do not, look at, look at verse 15. Do not regard him as an enemy, but what? Warn him as a brother. He's a brother. She's a sister. So Paul's letter in this, in the Word of God, right? Let me say, let me say that again. Paul's letter is the Word of God, right? And, and, uh, and thus it's worthy of obedience, the obedience of that particular church and consequently us. People that choose to consistently live contrary to the Word of God need to be addressed. In other words, this sin isn't the occasional slip-up, as I mentioned before. It's rather a pattern in their life. 
So if there's someone in the church that is constantly gossiping and slandering, and we just say, oh, that's just Mary Jo. We don't have any Mary Jo's in here, do we? I hope not. That's just Mary Jo. You know, what are you going to do? Gosh golly, you know. We, oh, isn't she cute? No, because that's a cancer. Not she. Her actions are a cancer. And Satan uses that to divide the church and harm his church. And so it needs to be addressed. Small, not big, small, needs to be taken care of. Okay? So, Paul says, take note of this person and have nothing to do with them in the Christian fellowship sense. Okay? In the Christian fellowship sense. In other words, don't pretend that they are right with God and act like nothing's wrong. Instead, go to that person and warn them because they are a professing member of the church of God. Is this difficult? And everyone said, yes, it's difficult. However, is this necessary? Yes, it's necessary for their good and for the good of the body. So picture yourself, if you will, as a white blood cell rooting out the infection in the body. Not in judgment because there's nothing special about you. There's nothing special about me. We just happen to be walking with the Lord at that particular time. And you know what? I want someone to come to me and tell me when I'm not. And when I'm not accurately reflecting the holiness of Christ. We should desire that as followers of Christ. And hopefully when confronted, they will repent and walk again as a follower of Jesus. All right, what about the Apostle John? Look at 2 John 9 and 10. It says this, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive them into your house or give them any greeting. So what is, what is the standard according to the Apostle John? The teachings of Christ. The teachings of Christ. John says that the standard is to abide in or to live in the teachings of Christ. If they do not, what does the text say? They, they do not have God. The warning, avoid false teachers. Do not welcome those who teach, whether professionally or within the congregation. Be careful. Do not welcome that false teacher into your home or into your church, for that matter. Do not greet them in the sense of fellowship. Do not bring them in. Side application here. Be careful about whose teaching you listen to on podcasts and online on the Internet. Just because they're on the Internet doesn't mean they're good and they're godly. Be wise. If you have any questions about it, you have godly people in this church that can help you with that. But be careful. You don't want to invite them into your home and invite them into your mind. Do not greet them, if you will. Please, please be discerning. And if you are lacking discernment, please talk to one of us. We'd be happy to help you with that. What about the Apostle Peter? Look at the book of Acts. In Acts 8, 17 through 24, it says this, Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. That's not very gentle. But, you know, it's Peter, so what are you going to do? You have, neither part of, you have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray, that the Lord, pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see, that, I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and that in the bond, in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. The church is just starting in this chapter, in, in this part of the book of Acts. And isn't it interesting that this kind of confrontation, this kind of discipline is already part of the DNA. Simon is a professing believer and he gets off track. And Peter, in a not so gentle fashion, uh, gives him the path back to the Lord. Do you see that? His desire is, you need to pray. You need to get back right with the Lord. 
He doesn't just pat him on the head and say, oh, that's a cute thing to say, Simon. No, he's very direct and very clear, and he's clear about getting back, being right with God. Simon at least gives a wise prayer request. Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you said may come upon me. So this is just a sampling of verses demonstrating that, the, that church discipline isn't relegated to Matthew 18. No, it's a theme I would submit to you throughout the New Testament. So what should we do with this? Be committed to personal holiness. First and foremost, be committed to personal holiness. Be a people committed to helping fellow church members walk in holiness. And for some of you, this means you need to take the step of membership. And this means we need to get involved in one another's lives. This means we need to be willing to lovingly speak the truth in one another's life. After all, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 says this, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. So in a sense, church discipline should be happening all the time at a personal level. Uh, like, like the level one, if you will, that Jesus talks about, right? We go to that person. We keep the circle small. And this should be happening all the time. If there's an offense, go get it taken care of. It doesn't need to go to level three. should rarely go to level three if we're, if we're dealing with one another on, a, on the level that we should be, not just dismissing or putting our head in the sand, but we're actually, we're actually speaking truth lovingly into one another's lives. So in other words, going to that person and resolving the sin issue before it grows and takes greater root. All right, so what is church discipline? Uh, well, what is, first of all, we got to see what Jesus' take is on church discipline and then the apostles' take on it. But lastly, we'll finish up with this, the purpose of church discipline. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to show you quickly seven purposes for church discipline. Letter A, discipline's purpose is to expose. Look at, look at verses 1 through 3. It's actually reported, Paul's talking about a very, very, difficult situation in, in the church at Corinth. He says, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from you. Hey, do you notice something there? There's no level one. There's no level two. Paul's like, Get, this is, what are you doing? This is serious. And he goes straight to level three. For, for though absent in the body, I'm present with you in spirit. And if, as if present, I will have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. Wow. Okay. What does that tell us? Well, sin needs to be exposed and it needs to be dealt with. And there are some times in church life, not all times, but there are some times where we have to go to level three. All right. Letter B. Discipline's purpose is to warn Look at verses 4 and 5. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Right? We want to warn this guy, and we want to let him know, hey, we're releasing you. you got to get things right, buddy. And we want, you to be, we want you to be right with God. It's a warning. But then also see... Its, its purpose is to save. You see that at the end of verse 5 too as well, that he might be saved in the day of the Lord. Letter D, discipline's purpose is to protect. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 says, your, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Right? So what happens? The yeast, what happens to yeast? It starts to spread through the whole part. of, And that's what happens with sin. It starts to spread throughout the body. And we need to be careful. So we need to protect Letter E, discipline's purpose is to purify. Look at 7 and 8. Cleanse out the old le leaven that you may be a new lump, that you are ready to be unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, but the leaven of malice and evil. No, no not those things, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Right. So the whole goal is let's get rid of this. We want to have a pure body. We don't want our body to be, be infected by sin. Letter F, discipline's purpose is to make Christ's church holy. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people. Not at all. 
meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since you would then need to leave the world. But I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of, I would submit to you, ongoing, unrepentant sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, not to even eat with such a one. Be careful, he's saying, right? The church is supposed to be holy. And then letter G, dis discipline's purpose is to be a distinct witness for Jesus to outsiders. Again, notice the judicial role the church plays in the sinning member of his church. Look at verse 12 of chapter 5. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is not, it is not those inside the church to whom you are to judge. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. You see the point? The church is to be pure. The church is to be holy. The church is to be full of professing and possessing believers. The evil person, the one caught up in sin, can no longer enjoy the benefit of being considered a member of the local church until they repent and are restored. Until this repentance takes place, they will live in kind of a limbo, knowing the truth, but not being considered full participants of the tr truth. Where am I? What, what, where am I with the Lord? And they ought to be off balance until they repent and start walking with the Lord again. So purging the evil person means to make certain the membership of your church is, is regenerated, spirit-filled, born-again followers of Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Because the local church is a representation of God's universal church, and there is no question that anyone... There's no question that anyone that is a part of his universal church is, in fact, born again, right? So what, is this, so what does this have to do with a distinct witness? Look at 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who, call you, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. As a purified and holy people, we are uniquely positioned to communicate the gospel that has changed us, that has brought us from death unto life. And because of that, we are now salt and light. That's what Matthew 5.13 says. So there they are, seven purposes behind church discipline. And do you notice what the purpose of church discipline isn't? It isn't about humiliation. It isn't about excommunication without some sort of hope. It isn't about angry retribution towards the sinner. Instead, it is about the restoration of the one who has gone astray from the revealed Word of God. And most importantly, it's about God keeping His bride, the church, holy and pure. So, are you willing to be, in, are you willing to be involved in church discipline? I know I've thrown a lot at you. And I'm hoping you chew on this. And I'm hoping you think this through because it's a big deal. We should be willing to participate in level one and level two of church discipline on a regular basis, okay? Level one, going to the person, getting it resolved. If that doesn't work, level two, we bring some people with us. The purpose of getting it resolved. You should be regularly participating in that. Don't, don't, just, don't just brush it off. We need to be working hard at preserving holiness in our lives and in the life of the church. But also recognize that church discipline isn't only in Matthew 18. But based on the other passages I shared with you, you can see it is more, uh, church discipline calls for a more nuanced uh, and discerning perspective. So we take it case by case, especially when it gets to the higher levels. We see that with Paul where he says, get him out right away. There's nuance, there's discernment in this. Jesus and the apostles have given us the tools. We must know and use them to keep the church of Christ holy. Remember, church discipline, if properly understood, is a powerful tool that keeps God's church not only holy but powerfully hopeful in a world that is slipping away in sinful decay. So my challenge to you this morning is this. Will you start by understanding the tools that God has given you in His Word and prayerfully use these tools for the glory of God and for the purity of His bride, the church. Father, thank You for the privilege of looking into this text. I know, Father, we've thrown a lot out there, but we've got the next 
two weeks to process these things together. And I pray, Father, that you would use these truths as we consider how it is you desire for us to function as a local church. Lord, you desire for us to be pure and holy and righteous. And God, help us with that. It's easy for us to fall into patterns of sin, but may we lovingly hold one another's feet to the fire so that we can all grow into unity and holiness together. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.